hello YouTube. Today on the Naughty Librarian, I am going over Taltos by Anne Rice. This is the finale of the Mayfair Witches series. And as you've read in the title, I actually like this one. I'm as shocked as all of you are, trust me. <laughs> like, surprisingly, it's kind of good. I think the main key here to my liking of this book is because they took out all of the sexual terror that the other two books were based on. It was just constant sexual terror all the time. And it was gross. And I, and I didn't like reading it. It made me feel, ugh. I don't wanna give it too much credit here. Like the sex stuff is still weird. There's still weird sex stuff going on here, but it's not terror. <laughs> like at its core, this book is kind of two things. One, it's a like a revenge story. And two, it's a moody book about feelings. Essentially, all of the sexual terror and trauma these characters have been through for the last two books, we have Taltos here where they start dealing with that trauma and they have to like come to terms with everything that's happened to them. And it has a lot of really, really good writing in this, especially like some of the emotional scenes. I mean, there is some terrifying stuff in here. Like, yikes. Oh my word. So yeah, let's just get into what went on in Taltos. Surprisingly, I liked it a lot. Okay, so the book starts off with a new character named Ashler, you know, Saint Ashler, the whole shebang from Lasher. This is the Ashler. And he's still alive. He's a Taltos. And he's basically just made a big name for himself, like in the toy world. Kind of like, you know, like FAO Schwartz, like if he was a seven foot tall mythological being. And he lives a very solitary life because, you know, there's no other Taltos around and they live for a long ass time. Like he's still around. He's like, I don't even know, like a couple thousand years old, at least at this point, like he's very old. And there's a whole lot more to his story than we have ever even imagined, but we will get to that later. In the meantime, right now, one day he gets a call from his friend Samuel. And now Samuel, he's another Taltos, but like a different kind of Taltos. Like essentially, uh, Samuel is one of the little people. That's what they call them. Um, it's basically, uh, a Taltos was born but they didn't get the milk <laughs> from the mother. So their growth was stunted. And sometimes they have like deformities because of that. Um, you know, and this is also in like the Celtic tradition. So think like leprechauns. I know we're, we're stretching some things here, but we're, it's not worse than the other stuff that's happened in this book. <laughs> anyway, Samuel, right? He calls up Ashler and he's like, hey, guess what? There was another Taltos, aka Lasher, uh, in Donleith recently. But he also found out from this Talamasca agent, Yuri, that, uh, that he's dead now. So there was another Taltos, but he's dead. But there's some other big shit going on here. You need to get your ass to Scotland ASAP right now. So Asher's like, okay, some shit's going down. Uh, I'm gonna hop on my corporate jet and go to Scotland. <laughs> so basically what had happened was, Yuri went back to England at the end of the last book to investigate the Talamasca's part in the plot to breed Taltos. While investigating Yuri, he came across like a whole community of Taltos. However, they're all like the little people. So they don't look like the Taltos he's expecting. And Yuri and Samuel end up teaming up with each other because the Talamasca tried to kill Yuri when he was with like the, the little people and he got shot and then Samuel saved his life because little people don't fuck around with that. <laughs> so like they push the assassin off a cliff and then he like nurses Yuri back to health as much as he's able to. So Ashler, he gets to Scotland, he checks in with Samuel, he meets Yuri, and Yuri's is really trying to figure out if like the whole Talamasca's a lie. Was it all built on this principle of trying to like breed Taltos and study them? Cause that's fucked up. And Ashler's like, no, bro, don't worry about it. That's totally not what it was. Like I was around when the Talamasca started. So it has to be just like a splinter group within the Talamasca that's like gone rogue. And then things, Take a turn for the worse because Yuri, he calls up Mona to check in on her. How are you doing? You know, he got shot. He's been out of contact for a while and he finds out the worst possible news. Guess what, everybody? 
the Talamasca not only tried to kill Yuri, they also tried to kill Aaron and they were successful. Like they killed Aaron. Aaron is dead. And not even like low key assassination here. They like hit him with a car and then ran over him a bunch. Like it was not subtle. <laughs> they like killed the shit out of Aaron. It is, I'm so upset. Everyone likes Aaron. Yuri is Aaron's protege. Like he's crushed. He, he doesn't know what to do. He's also, you know, been shot. It's infected. He's not in his right mind. He's also really scared for Mona because the Talabasca is going to get exactly what they want because guess what? All of these weird Mayfair genetics have produced several good candidates that they could use to make more Taltos and Mona is one of them. So he's like, oh shit, everything's going to pieces. I don't know what I'm going to do. He takes off. He is Ash and Sam the, the slip. He just runs off and he calls back the Mayfair house again and he tells Rowan what's going on and they start launching a plan. So we're gonna put a pin in that and we're gonna come over to what's been happening with Rowan. Rowan went through a hell of a lot in the book Lasher and in the end of that book she killed MLF, her daughter, by Lasher and um, she hasn't been doing well since then. Rowan has kind of slipped into this kind of catatonic state like she'll dress herself and she'll drink whatever smoothie Michael makes. So she has like food coming into her body. And then she just stares off at the place where she buried MLF all day and never talks to anyone. So, you know, she has to work through some trauma here. Okay, Rowan's not doing well mentally. And Mona is also not really doing all that great mentally. She's really struggling with her place as the new inheritor of the Mayfair legacy. She doesn't really want all the responsibility, even though, you know, she does really like the wealth and power that comes with it, but she's 13. <laughs> like, she, this is a lot for her to have to deal with. And on top of that, she also feels real guilty about, you know, seducing Michael while Rowan was gone. So she banged Rowan's husband. She feels a bit guilty about all that. And Mona still kind of has the hots for Michael a little bit, even though like now they're just kind of like exes. They're like friends who used to bang, but now they don't anymore. And she even gets jealous of other people that Michael might be attracted to. Because in this book, we do get introduced to a new branch of the Mayfair family. I know, there's actually another branch. I thought this tree was just one stick at this point, but nope, it's got one branch. And that's the Fontevaux Mayfairs. They were the ones who live in the oldest Mayfair house, the first one they built in the United States. And it's like in a swamp and it's been slowly sinking into the swamp ever since. These are like the hillbilly cousins. And one of them is named Mary Jane. And she is like a babe. She's like the hottest hot girl. She's 19. Michael seems to find her attractive. Mona is beside herself over this. <laughs> but that all being said, Mona does feel bad about banging Michael. So she starts spending a lot of time with Rowan. She wants Rowan to get better. She talks to her all day and, you know, tries to get her to engage with people. But, you know, Rowan is just sitting there staring at a grave all day. She doesn't talk until one day she, when she does start talking again, she starts talking to Mona and acknowledging her. And the moment that Rowan started talking again was actually the moment where Aaron was killed. Mona is kind of the only person that Rowan really wants to turn to right now because she's also a powerful witch. Mind you, she's 13, but we're gonna go with it here. So they kind of team up to investigate things a bit. They go to the morgue and she views Aaron's body and, and she uses her powers on the body to at least find out that at least Aaron didn't suffer. Like he, he, he died immediately. He wasn't like alive and being hurt, but still someone fucked with Aaron and Rowan is not having this business. She's like, you know what? I have a lot of trauma. I need to exercise from my body. So you know what? I'm going to go after the people that killed Aaron. Vengeance will be mine. So Rowan and Mona, they go back to the Mayfair house and we have to deal with the whole Rowan and Michael relationship here because, you know, they were like so bug nuts in love in the first book. And then both of them have done really fucked up things to each other. Like Rowan 
willingly ran off with, you know, um, Lasher. Michael, he banged a 13 year old. Like, you know, they both have done fucked up things to each other. How does this relationship move forward from here? They also have to work this out because like a lot of shit has gone down. But at the end of the day, they do still love each other, even though they have a lot of issues they're gonna have to work out. So they kind of just make up with each other sexually. And it's it's so refreshing to see consensual sex in this book again. <laughs> like, I'm like, wow, oh my gosh, there's no terror right now. It's just two people banging each other consensually. But besides the consensual sex aspect of the scene, it is about, you know, moody feelings. Like Rowan, you know, was imprisoned and sexually assaulted by Lasher multiple times. She has a lot of bodily autonomy she's trying to recover in her life. And one step is to be with Michael consensually, get back to a healthier sexual relationship. So it's important for the book to have this scene in. So I think it's actually well done, well placed. It progresses the characters forward in time. It's not just like, here's scary sex stuff. <laughs> so yeah, it's actually important. It's like about their relationship growing, Rowan kind of starting to recover, at least physically. So after the bang fest, Rowan starts getting ready to go off to London and meet up with Yuri because basically she's going to London to start killing some nerds with a Braden kink. Like she's out for revenge and she's planning to not tell Michael about it. She's just gonna go to London and leave him behind. <laughs> we were doing so well. <laughs> Mona, the 13 year old voice of reason here finds out and she's like, Rowan, oh my God, if you like ditch Michael, he's never going to get over that. Like for real, you can't do that. So Rowan's like, yeah, yeah, okay. You make a lot of good points. I will bring Michael with me. We'll both go get revenge on the nerds. Let's go. Mona also wants to come because she was also close with Aaron, but she can't because guess what? I, I, you probably already guessed, right? Um, she's pregnant with Michael's baby. She wants to keep it. Rowan, surprisingly cool with it. I mean, like, what can she do at this point? She can't unfuck Mona. So it's like, <laughs> like, you might as well be cool with this. Rowan and Michael, they go off to London and they are both full on in league with each other in their villain era. They're gonna go hunt some nerds. Let's stick a pin in Rowan for a second. Let's go over to the Talamasca. Cause a lot of shit is going down with the Talamasca. So like I was saying, Yuri and Ash, they believe it's only like a little splinter group within the Talamasca who knew about this Breed the Taltos plan. And it was being led in particular by this guy named Stuart Gordon. And his accomplices were these two students, Marklin and Tommy. So apparently what had happened was Marklin and Tommy acted against Stuart's wishes and they were the ones who put the hit out on Aaron and Yuri. Stuart, super pissed at these guys. He's like, you are idiot children. What the fuck are you doing? Everybody likes Aaron and you killed him. What were you thinking? Like Stuart and Aaron were like besties. Like it's fucked up what happened here. But like in the end of things, Stuart kind of agrees with, you know, Tommy and Marklin because they were right. Like he knew too much. He was gonna expose their plan and they had to eliminate witnesses. Their whole plot here is that they want to successfully breed Taltos in order to be able to learn their history straight from the source because Taltos are born knowing things. They know their history being born. So like, they're like, this is like a huge nerdy historical source. We, we gotta, we gotta get it. We gotta get these Taltos breeding. And they're super fanatical about it. And guess what? They've already procured a female Taltos. So like they're well on their way. They just gotta find a boy Taltos to, to fuck her. <laughs> That's what, this is the plan at the moment. So while all this plotting is happening, Ash goes over to the London Talamasca office and he knows this like really convoluted back entry because mind you, he's been with the Talamasca since it was created. Like he knows the back way in. And he goes and he looks around and he's like, okay, I'm gonna know if people are innocent because like, I'm obviously a Taltos. There's a lot of like physical characteristics that make him look like, like uncanny valley human. So he's like, 
if they see me and they know I'm a Taltos, they're guilty. And like, he's walking around. No one really knows that he's a Taltos. Like, so he's like, okay, okay. Pretty much everybody's innocent here, but not Anton Marcus, who is the superior general of the Talamasca. Ash takes justice into his own hands, literally, and he chokes him to death for sanctioning the murders and being overall very corrupt. He just kills the guy. And this like causes a big commotion in the Talamasca because like this really tall guy walked in our, in our back door, strangled our leader, and then walked the fuck back out. Like <laughs> They're like, what is going on right now? So like, so all of these Talamasca members are all coming together at the London office to, you know, mourn. And also they got to get a new superior general. There's a lot going on here. You know, Marklin and Tommy are also in the mix here. And they're so worried because they're like, oh shit. Like so many people are coming to the London office right now. I don't know where Stuart is. Stuart's not here right now. Like Yuri is alive, they find out. They're like, oh fuck, they're gonna know. He's gonna know it was us who tried to kill him. These guys very much feel like Billy and Stuart in Scream, honestly, where they're just like hanging out around everybody at the London office and they're just trying real hard not to be suspicious. <laughs> like that's their whole thing. Like, all right, let's just like be chill. Like no one will know we're the murderers, you know? <laughs> like that's their whole plan here. So while all that is happening, like Rowan and Michael, they finally arrive in London. They go meet up with Yuri. Uh, Yuri, he tells them about everything that happened, including meeting the other Taltos, like Samuel and Ash. He tells them all about them, but he's also losing his shit about everything going on because, you know, his father figure just got killed. He's shot. He probably needs more medical attention than he's actually getting. He's worried about Mona getting kidnapped. He's kind of hysterical at this point, <laughs> but, Rowan like sits him down. She's like, hey, you need to get your shit together. Who do you think is behind this? Like, who are the likely suspects in the Talamasca? And they're, they couldn't really come up with an idea, but Yuri's like, okay, you know what? I'm gonna call Stuart Gordon because he was Aaron's bestie. And like, if anyone's gonna know what's going on, it's gonna be him. So Rowan's like, all right, cool. I have a plan. I'm gonna need Ashler for it. So the plan is Yuri, He's going to call Stuart Gordon and he's going to get him to, to come to like a public place to meet him. And once he's there, they're going to bring Ashler over. And if Stuart sees Ashler, knows he's a tall toast, then he's guilty. If he meets Ash and doesn't know he's a tall toast, innocent. It's not a very complex plan. <laughs> However, the plan is rather effective because, you know, Stuart gets there, he sees Ashler, knows the whole Taltos thing, he's obviously super guilty. Also in a whole heap of trouble because now he has a Taltos, Yuri, and two witches, Rowan and Michael, all watching him dead. So yeah, he's in trouble right now. Um, the only way he gets out of being like murdered on the spot <laughs> is because he tells them, hey, guess what? I have a female Taltos. You can't kill me or you can't get the female Taltos. So Stuart takes them all to go meet the female Taltos. Her name is Tessa. And she's basically kind of just like locked in a tower Rapunzel style. However, she's not really necessarily like a prisoner there. She actually wants to be there. Like Stuart takes good care of her. And when she's like in this tower, she doesn't have to worry about a bunch of men being around to, you know, sexually torment her because she's been through some shit and she hasn't seen another Taltos in like, I don't even know how long, hundreds of years at least. So she and Ash meet each other. And it's actually like a really lovely scene where like they dance and like sing the songs of their people. And it's like a really sweet moment between them. And Stuart is so happy this is happening. He's like, oh my gosh, can I watch you mate? I want to see the baby come out. And everyone's like, ew, bro. Like, oh my gosh, this is a lot right now. You just met them. <laughs> Uh -huh. However, Ash has to be the one to break it to Stuart that like Tessa is a whole hell of a lot older than he thinks she is because Taltos, they don't age like humans do. They basically always look youthful. Like they all look like 30 years old, essentially forever until they die. <laughs> the only way you can tell age on a Taltos is if their hair goes gray and Tessa all of her hair is gray. She's very old. Like already gone through menopause old, she can't have children anymore. Like Stuart is so devastated by this because basically this means his whole life's work 
has amounted to absolutely nothing. <laughs> he did all of this. He had people killed. He did all of this bad stuff for nothing. So f fuck you, Stuart, right? <laughs> So since everything has been such an anti-climax, well, there's nothing more to be done now. And Ash is like, all right, murder time. I'm going to kill Stuart now. Stuart, he tries to pull a fast one on everybody. He whips out a gun that was hidden and he's like threatening to shoot them all. But guess what? Rowan, it doesn't matter. She just like looks at him and stops his heart because that's her magical ability. So she just like kills him across the room. This is what she came to London for. She was going to kill some nerds and she is succeeding in her plans. So now they have a dead body a very old female tall toast. What are they gonna do? Ash, Rowan, and Michael, they decide to leave. They're gonna go back to um, America where they all live. And Yuri's gonna stay behind. Basically what he's gonna do, he's gonna go back to the Talamasca. He's gonna get justice for Aaron. And he's gonna bring Tessa back to the Talamasca because like, these are the nice nerds who don't wanna hurt her. They'll just take care of her. You know, she's super old. <laughs> like, what else are you gonna do with her? So. It kind of works out for the best. When Yuri gets back to the Talamasca, like he basically just tells them everything that went down and he has all of the evidence he could ever want. You know, he has Stuart's dead body and Tessa. <laughs> like obviously his story is accurate. And the Talamasca are like, those little shits, Marklin and Tommy, Oh, they're going to get it. Like they are so mad and they turn on them immediately. So the Talamasca captures Tommy and Marklin. They've been hanging out, trying to be not suspicious. They grab them. They take them for their punishment. And like things get fucked up from here on because like basically they just take them and they throw them down like a 30 foot hole that apparently is only used for throwing people down it because at the bottom there's all these old bones. <laughs> it's like this is, it's the body hole. <laughs> and, and Tommy dies in the fall. Lucky Tommy. Marklin doesn't. He like just breaks his ankle. Like he's overall kind of okay. And the whole scene is just so terrifying to read because like they threw him down a hole and all he can do is scream and hear the echoes of his scream because he's completely alone in the dark and they brick off the wall so no one can ever get to him again. And he's, they just leave him to die in the body hole. Basically, moral of the story here is, damn, don't mess with librarians. Oh my gosh, this scene is terrifying to read, frankly. <laughs> so on that cheery note, let's put a pin in that. Let's go see what's been happening with Mona because, you know, she's pregnant with Michael's baby. And the whole elephant in the room here is that Mona and Michael both have all of that extra DNA. This baby is a Taltos. And Mona confirms this when she goes to the doctor and the doctor tells her she's way more pregnant than she is supposed to be at this point in time. So this baby is growing super fast. And she's also starting to be able to like telepathically communicate with the baby. And she ends up naming her Morrigan. Mona starts like um, hallucinating or experiencing Mona's um, like soul memories, like in dreams and while awake. So she's like this all over the place. But at the end of the day, she's kind of alone because she doesn't want to tell Rowan and Michael because they kind of have a track record of killing Taltos and she, and she doesn't want him to kill her baby. So she's like, doesn't know where to turn. However, guess what? Cousin Mary Jane, the hillbilly cousin, back in town. And she comes to stay at the Mayfair house for a little bit. And you know what? Mona and her actually end up being like really good friends. They have a shit ton of stuff in common. They're relatively close in age. And like, they both are really powerful witches. They actually kind of formed this like really cute friendship that I'm living for. Like I love Mona Mary Jane friendship. So the one person Mona trusts with, you know, her baby is Mary Jane. So she's like, Mary Jane, we gotta get out of here because I'm worried shit's gonna go down. So she and Mary Jane bust out of the Mayfair house, Thelma Louise style, and they go over to Fontevaux, which is that old decrepit house sinking into the swamp. It's been sinking for like over a hundred years and just stubbornly won't go down. <laughs> but there are some Mayfairs who live in like the swamp area. But there's really no time to dwell on the sinking house because by the time they get from the Mayfair house to Fontevaux, uh, Mona is going into labor. Like this baby is grown very rapidly. It's birth in time. And luckily 
Granny Dolly Jean is there and she helps with the birth because other swamp Mayfairs have given birth to walking babies before. Like this has happened several times apparently and the rest of the family didn't know that Taltos were being born <laughs> in the swamp. So uh, yeah, so she gives birth. Morgan grows into a full grown woman baby right away. She helps Mona recover from the birth. Morgan is just like a complete spitting image of Mona. Like they look almost identical, except, you know, Morgan is like seven feet tall. She's a tall though. So real tall. <laughs> so now they have like a full grown woman baby on their hands. What are they going to do? So since they really don't have a better plan, um, Mona, Mary Jane, Dolly Jean, and Morrigan all just decide they're going to go back to the Mayfair house. So they get back to the Mayfair house, they settle in, and Mary Jane and Mona, they promise Morrigan they're going to protect her from anybody who means to do her harm. Like, they're her girls, like they're going to protect her. Plus, technically speaking here, Mona, as the Mayfair inheritor, has now had a daughter. Morrigan is technically now the new inheritor of the Mayfair legacy. So like things are getting complicated. So they just all settle in and they're going to wait for Rowan and Michael to get back from the trip and figure shit out from there. On that note, Rowan and Michael and Ash, they all decide they're going to go back to New York. They all get on Ash's corporate jet. They fly back to New York and, and they all like have this like new friendship between them. I, I guess killing Stuart together really acted as like a bonding experience. And now they're all like, besties and they're like have this deep connection to each other it's a whole thing so ash starts telling them like his whole life story so let's have a quick flashback here to the story of ashler so basically a long long time ago in the land before time <laughs> there was like all the taltos and they all lived on this tropical island off the coast of Britain in the North Sea. So like, obviously this was a long time ago if there were still tropical areas up there. And all the Taltos, they lived in harmony with each other and nature. One day a volcano goes off and it destroys the island and the Taltos have to flee to the next piece of land over, which is Scotland. And there was a real steep learning curve for the Taltos because none of them had ever experienced winter before they came from a tropical climate to like snowy as scotland a lot of them died just from like exposure however the ones that survived they become kind of like a hunter gatherer society and ash is like kind of the de facto leader because he's like the most clever out of all of them but then the human beings come along and shit takes a turn for the worse basically the humans they just do raids on the taltos villages they like burn them down, they kill people, they steal the women, just carnage everywhere. And the remaining Taltos, after all of these raids that have been going on for a long time, they really don't have a choice at this point. They can just stay here and keep getting fucked up by the humans, or they could move to a safer place. So Ashler, he takes his tribe and he moves them north and he also rescues like as many Taltos as he can along the way on the trip north and they eventually settle in Donley, Scotland. Mainly just because it was really hard to get to. However, the Taltos who arrive in Donleith have seen some shit. They're not like this harmonious, peaceful people anymore. They've been exposed to violence and like a lot of them are like, man, why don't we just go annihilate the humans? Like, fuck these guys. That doesn't end up happening because ultimately at the end of the day, the Taltos as a species and a culture, they just don't have the requisite brutality to accomplish that. So instead of conquering the world, the Taltos kind of take up a if you can't beat them, join them mentality. And they just start assimilating into the human world as very tall humans known as the Picts, which are, you know, a historical clan of people. Um, they're like, we're Picts and we have a different culture, but we're humans, we're just tall. <laughs> like They're just becoming one with the humans around them to try to like hide in plain sight. And generally speaking, things run pretty smooth for the most part. Occasionally some humans would know about Taltos and start some shit. But overall, people just assume they're just tall humans. It works out. That is until Christianity comes to Scotland and things take another turn for the worse here. So the priests come and they're talking about Christianity as this like religion about love and forgiveness 
and, and justice and, and a big one is chastity as well. You know, all of the stuff that Talto's culture was based on. Plus all these early Christians were also running over here because they were being persecuted and forced out of their homes much like the Taltos themselves were. So it's kind of just a big instant kinship with these early Christian missionaries. So Ashler, as king, he converts to Christianity and about two thirds of the other Taltos convert with him. Now the other third of the Taltos, they don't wanna convert. They think Christianity is a big old pack of lies. They're not fucking around with this. So they turn to a new leader named Janet and Janet and Ash have like a whole past with each other where like they had produced babies before in the past. They were frequent partners, but they just have a big ideological difference between them. Janet's like, man, I don't want to fuck with Christianity. And then like Ashler's all about it. And this difference of ideology sparks a civil war between the Christian Taltos and the non-Christian Taltos. Basically only two things come out of this civil war. One, carnage. Thousands of Taltos and humans all die. They all kill each other. It's a mess. And two, the humans start getting real suspicious of those tall humans because like, hey, why don't y'all have any children? I've never seen a baby tall person and you don't seem to age. And like, there's something going on here. And Ashler tries to like settle the humans down because they have a history of being violent to Taltos. And he's like, um, I, I'm a priest. Guess what, everybody? I'm a priest and I'm celibate. I can't hurt anybody. I'm not even fucking people. <laughs> like that's his big plan. But Janet is having none of this ruse. And she's like, no, guess what? We're Taltos. We got all this stuff we did. We were older than you guys. We live forever. And like our babies come out like full grown adult size. And she just starts running her mouth about Taltos and the humans and their tiny brains cannot handle these facts. And they're like, nope, you all are demons and you all gotta die. So the humans turn on the remaining Taltos and start the slaughter again. So Civil War Part Two, Electric Boogaloo commences. So at the end of all the fighting, Ashler and like four or five other Taltos men are the only ones still alive in Donleith. Like all of the other Taltos and Donleith have been killed. And the humans, they capture Janet and they burn her at the stake like a witch because that's how they do things. But as she's being burned at the stake, Janet is gonna go out on her own badass terms. So she starts cursing people. She's like, I curse the clan of Donleith for bringing a false god to their land. And, and I curse you, Ashler, most of all. I hope you like blue balls because I curse you to never get with a female Taltos ever again. A lot of curses come out of Janet. And like after she's dead, Ashler and the few remaining Taltos, um, they, they're still around all these humans that have been killing a lot of Taltos. So they're like, um, we're all priests. Wouldn't you know? Guess what? We're all priests. We're all celibate. We're your friends. We're just tall. <laughs> like they're still trying to talk them into things. Like luckily it works though. And like the people just kind of accept them. Ashler was very charismatic and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? We like tall priests. Okay. You guys can stay if you're going to be priests. Like that's fine. So, you know, crisis averted. Ashler and the few other guys, they get to live for now so long as they're priests. However, Ashler knows how fast a human mob can turn against a Taltos. I mean, look what happened to Janet. So that's always at the back of his mind. And then finally, Ash, he's just doesn't really have anything left for Donleith. And he's like, I got nothing anymore here. So I'm just going to leave. <laughs> so he just leaves Donleith. He's going to go adventure out in the world for centuries until like, the you know medieval era like the 1200s he decides you know what i've been away for like a while maybe i'll go back to donley for a visit and when ash gets to donley he starts realizing like the story of saint ashler has become wildly exaggerated and he's like what is going on here there is a stained glass image of me in the cathedral as a saint and I don't remember that happening. <laughs> so he's like, what's going on? So apparently after Ash left the village, they kept on the old ways of having a Taltos priest because like it was very in vogue. Like, oh, your city doesn't have a Taltos priest. 
you're not that cool. Like that was the whole vibe back then. Then like every once in a while, like a Taltos would just kind of be born accidentally. And the town would be like, oh, yay, it's the reincarnation of St. Ashler. There he is. He comes again. That's that's their story. And that's just kind of how it goes for like a long time. As long as the Taltos being born is, you know, controllable and male, because if they're unruly or female, the town just burns them. <laughs> so still not a great place to be a Taltos unless you're the priest. And Ash is like, you know what? I don't know why I came back to Scotland. Y'all are still just as fucked up as when I left. <laughs> so he leaves again. He's like, I'm not dealing with you guys. He just wanders the world for centuries again. And that kind of just takes us up till now, basically. In his very long life, he's had a lot of time to think about things. And basically, he just no longer even wants to bother trying to bring back the Taltos as a species because they're extinct for the most part because a new, stronger species, humans, came along and drove them out. That's kind of the natural order of things. Like at the end of the day, if he really set his mind and his dick to it, like he could bring back all the Taltos and essentially take over the world. But you know, like what would be the point in it anymore? Like he's too old for that shit. He's just happy to have some new friends with Rowan and Michael because ultimately he's very lonely. He's just a singular Taltos and he can't really have relationships with people, especially women, because, you know, uterine hemorrhages. So that's his life. To get back to the United States, Rowan and Michael, they stay with Ash for a little bit. And there's a lot of like emotional bonding here. Rowan's still kind of dealing with all of the trauma she went through, especially losing Emileth, even though, you know, there's a lot of complicated feelings there but essentially this was her daughter and she killed her and she was innocent on all this and also she can't have any more children so she's kind of mourning that loss still and being with ash really kind of helps her recover but they can't stay with ash forever they have to go back to new orleans so she and michael they leave and ash is alone again and oh boy his loneliness is like really hitting him this time, like, <laughs> like harder than normal, because he misses having people around who like know who he truly is because no one else in his life really knows him. So he packs up like his two most prized possessions he owns. And he like sends them to Rowan and Michael so that like they'll continue to love him. He really wants them to like not forget about him. It's actually really kind of sad and you really feel for Ashler and like you really feel the depth of his loneliness. And Rowan and Michael, they get back to New Orleans. They go to the Mayfair house. Obviously a lot has happened since they left. Overall, like the Mayfairs are doing okay. So they're like, oh wow, you know what? Our relationship is better. We got a new friend in New York and like, the family's okay, we're doing all right. And it's like, ooh, when's the other shoe gonna drop? Things are going too well for you. <laughs> and like, this is when they drop. Rowan and Michael, they get back to the Mayfair house only to find the trio, Mona, Mary Jane, and Morrigan. Obviously, this is a big shock for them. All of a sudden, there's a Taltos in the house and it's Michael's baby. They're gonna need a minute to compose themselves. But so does Morrigan because she can smell ash all up on them she smells a male taltos she's just born and she's already boy crazy they grow up so fast so all of them kind of sit down together and they talk about what's gonna happen next what's the state of things here and they all come to this understanding basically morrigan even though she's in a full-grown woman body she still is only a few days old she needs parents and rowan and michael and mona are going to take up that role and help her grow up mentally and emotionally. And then what later on, when she's a bit more mature, they will agree to introduce her to Ash. Right now, you need to cool your jets. You can't just go run off after Ash. You need to get your shit together. And they're all agree to this plan of action. This is what they're gonna do. They all kind of are a happy, albeit very unusual family. And this whole happy family business works out for all of five days because Ash, he really misses Rowan and Michael so much. And they didn't call him when they got back to New Orleans. Like 
obviously we know why they were dealing with some stuff, but he's like, did they like forget me? Like, should I check on them? Are they in trouble? So like he gets on his jet, he goes to New Orleans. He's like, all right, I'm just gonna go check on them and make sure they're okay. So he goes to the Mayfair house and he's like, oh damn, there's a female Taltos in there. Like I smell it immediately. And he's immediately like so hurt that like Rowan and Michael, these people he trusted, his friends, were keeping this huge secret from him on purpose. And they like lied to him. He's like very devastated actually. So he's like horny and sad at the same time. But then Morrigan, she catches Ash's scent and she's like, oh my God, there's a male Taltos around. Everybody shut up, everyone shut up. I need to do something about this. So she literally just like parkours through the window. And so she runs over to Ash and instead of saying hello, they just start like violently making out and grabbing each other's genitals. It, it's kind of a lot for like a 6 p.m. on a Tuesday in the front lawn, but like, here we are. And Rowan and Michael, they're just like, all right, like, just go, <laughs> like they just give up. They're like, okay, go ahead. You guys are gonna go off and do stuff. So Ashy picks up Morgan and he runs as fast as his long legs will take him back to his jet because they're gonna go back to Don Leaf for some big time ceremonial mating kind of a happy ending because that's the end of the book. <laughs> so yeah, that was Taltos. It was kind of a lot. <laughs> like it's very strange at points, but like I can handle weird. I just don't want to deal with sexual terror and this book removed all the sexual terror and I actually kind of liked it. There are some very like scary moments in here. The body hole that they threw those guys down, that was terrifying to read. It was really well written. And like a lot of like Rowan trying to, you know, recover after all of the trauma she went through. There's a lot of this book about her just like recovering and like finding herself again. It's actually really good. I am just as surprised as everybody else that I really like this. In the end, I gave it four stars because it's still super weird. Like I can't give it five because it's bizarre, but like, I actually really like it. Who knew? <laughs> like I went into this book with so many nervous feelings because I was like, oh God, what are they going to do next? And you know what? They surprised me. That's what they did next. All right. Let me know in the comments down below. Uh, what did you think about Taltos? Were you also surprised? Like I was because like, oh boy, I am so surprised by this. If you like this video, make sure you give it a like. If you want to see more videos, make sure you subscribe. And if you want cool exclusive content, including early access to videos and a book club, you can consider becoming a channel member or a patron. Links for that are in the description down below. And on that note, I will see you guys soon. Goodbye.